Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Thirumai Banerjee and here's a look at the stories for the day. How many rural households in India have piped water connections for drinking? How many of them have exclusive access to a toilet? And what are the primary sources of energy for cooking? The recent report by the National Statistical Office has the answers to these socio-economic indicators. Bhashwar Kumar tells you what the critical indicators say about the state of rural India. In the 78th round of its nationwide sample survey, the National Sample Survey Office carried out the Multiple Indicator Survey or MIS covering the entire country. The initial plan was to conduct the survey during the January-December 2020 period, but the field work was extended up to August 2021 due to the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns. So, what do select national indicators provided by the MIS report say about the state of rural India? With regard to a household's principal source of drinking water, from which it obtained most of its portable water during the past 365 days, the survey's sobering finding was that the percentage of persons reported to have piped water into their dwelling, yard or plot was just a shade below 25% for rural India. It was slightly more than 61% for urban. However, 95% in rural and just a bit more than 97% in urban India reported they had access to an improved source of drinking water. Bottled water, piped water into dwelling, piped water to yard or plot, piped water from neighbour and public tap or standpipe, among others, were considered to be improved sources of drinking water. For the purpose of the survey, a household was considered to have access to a latrine if the majority of its members had the facility of using it, irrespective of whether it was actually used by them or not. The survey found that slightly less than 69% of rural households reported access to a latrine that was meant for exclusive use by them, while in urban India, almost 81% of households reported the same. However, the alarming finding was that slightly over 21% of rural households reported that they had no access to a latrine at all. Only about 3% of households in urban India reported the same. Still, a comparison of data from NSS 78th round and NSS 76th round shows that the percentage of rural households with access to a latrine has improved to some extent. The NSS 76th round was conducted during July-December 2018. The survey also found that almost 47% of rural households were still using firewood, chips and crop residue as their primary source of energy used for cooking. Only about 6% of urban households reported the same. So, how do experts view these findings of the survey? And what do they think it says about the state of rural India? On the one hand, you certainly see a story of incremental progress. We aren't moving backwards, we are moving forwards, but perhaps we are not moving as fastly forward as we would like. um, And as from a political point of view, we often state. The reality is the two particular transitions that you are tra- that that we are speaking about uh, uh, to, uh, safe uh, sanitation and drinking and and safe twenty uh, piped drinking water supply, these are difficult transaction transaction intensive and complicated things to achieve. Uh, they require both social shifts. They also require state capacity of an order that India simply doesn't have. It is true that the number of latrines have gone up uh, over the last 10 years, but we are nowhere close to open defecation-free situation. In fact, it has also been found that even those who have toilets, do not all the members of the household do not use them. Secondly, in the case of cooking gas as well, it's been seen that even when families have got cylinders, they don't uh, necessarily refill them, often because of affordability and accessibility issues. Also, what do they think can be done to ensure an improvement in these indicators in rural India? 
the one arena that will accelerate progress is if these particular services are decentralized to local governments, particularly panchayats and municipalities. No country anywhere in the world has achieved these basic public provisioning without the strong and uh, visible and accountable presence of local governments. India tries to do this from New Delhi, not from the local panchayat in the village where people access sanitation services and drinking water facilities. We will only achieve fast progress by strengthening and empowering our local governments. In the case of gas cylinders, refilling depends on the price. And with the change in the subsidy norms, the uh, gas cylinders have become quite expensive. And oftentimes, it's also very difficult to access the centers from where they can get a fresh cylinder. So the, this infrastructure needs to be improved and the subsidy needs to be continued for everybody if people are to be able to afford them. In the case of toilets, it's an issue of both infrastructure, not just of the toilets, but improving the uh, water supply and uh, drainage systems. Along with that, uh, there is a behavioral component as well. And that needs to be addressed to various kinds of campaigns. The impact of rural India lagging in these select indicators will be seen in a greater burden on the healthcare system and poorer socio-economic development outcomes. As the country sets ambitious growth targets, achieving them will become more difficult if rural India does not progress on an equal footing with its urban counterpart. Not all rural indicators paint a rosy picture, but the average Indian continues to be optimistic about economic growth and is looking forward to splurging more. That's what the latest data on the Index of Consumer Sentiments hints at. The index has been steadily improving since the beginning of 2023. However, this improvement is not significant in rural India. Our next report by Tushar Verma will look at the reasons behind improving consumer sentiments and the causes of rural-urban divide. India's Index of Consumer Sentiment, or ICS, increased 4.2% in January and 5.1% in February. This is what Mahesh Vyas, CEO of Centre for Monitoring Indian Economy, said in an opinion piece for Business Standard. The increase in consumer sentiment in the first two months of the year shows that at an overall level, ICS increased by 9.5% in 2023. A key comparison can be done with the index performance in December 2022. The 30 days moving average of the ICS for the first 10 weeks of 2023, ending March 12, was 9.9% higher. A survey by Deloitte on the financial well being of Indian consumers echoes similar improvements. According to the survey, 24% of all consumers feel that their financial situation has worsened over the past year. This is much better than September 2022, when 34% of all consumers in India felt this way about their financial situation. This begs the question, what are the reasons behind this improving consumer sentiment? There have been hiccups like COVID-1, COVID-2, etc. But after that, the growth has been steadily uh, good. Now, what happens is there is this uh, uh, festive time when the sentiments go up, then there's a small pause, and then it resumes the increase. And that's what's happened around now. So we had this growth uh, running up till October, then November, December was a little uh, quieter, and Jan, Feb, and even March looks good now. The sentiment is improving because of various reasons. I think one is that there is an overall sense of confidence that the that the economy continues to do well. Also, I think the overall overall policies of the from the RBI perspective, in terms of the of the measures they have taken to control inflation, while interest rates have gone up, and that is having some some impact. But overall, you know, the 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 sense that consumers seem to get is that there is a that that things are quite steady. However, the improving consumer sentiment has also pronounced the urban-rural divide. The growth in urban sentiments outpaced rural sentiments during the first 10 weeks of 2023. Urban ICS improved by 15.2%. The increase in rural India was half of it, at 7.6%. 
The consumer sentiment in rural India is in tandem with the employment and labor participation data. Not only the rural labor participation rate fell to 40.9% in February from 41% in January, the unemployment rate in rural India also increased from 6.5% to 7.2% during the same period. So, what do experts have to say about this divergence in consumer sentiments between rural and urban India? So, what's going on is in urban India, employment is increasing a little more than in rural India. Rural India is seeing the uh, labor participation rate falling and the unemployment rate rising. So, a larger proportion of the urban people are getting employment, therefore they're getting wages, therefore they're feeling a little more confident of themselves. So I think that the 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 reason for the divergence is that uh, you know there is a this is a this is a sort of a K-shaped recovery while interest rates going up with the cost of various inputs going up, fuel prices going up, which impacts the rural uh, rural poor. All those prices going up, people have become very cautious about where they spend. You can see some level of down trading in 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 consumer goods as well, moving from large pack sizes to smaller pack sizes, holding off uh, you know their 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 purchases of non-essential products. So all of this sort of indicates that. There is a there is softness in that. It's not just in rural; it's even the urban poor. Wherever the incomes are low, it's a low income segment which is which has been you know which has been more affected by that. The latest inflation data of 6.4 percent has only come as a slight relief, since this is still above RBI's upper tolerance limit of 6 percent. Another rate hike is expected. The RBI's Monetary Policy Committee hiked the repo rate by 25 basis point to 6.5 percent following its last meeting on February 8. How will these factors impact consumer sentiments in the coming months? Uh, I think the consumer sentiments will rise. Uh, it will continue to rise, and I see no reason why there should be any stoppage in that. We are still low at around 88 uh, compared to a base of 100 before pandemic. Before pandemic, the index was 105 actually, and now it's down to 88. So there's a lot of coverage to be done even now, and I see no reason why. In the next six months, we should not cross the pre-pandemic levels. While consumer sentiments have been improving in India, it is still below the pre-pandemic levels. Experts believe the economic indicators of FY24 will be better than FY23, which will improve the sentiment index. However, while RBI is working to contain inflation, the rising interest rates might tamper with consumer sentiment. Turning to the markets. The banking turmoil in the West has left domestic equities turbulent, and the likely trend ahead could be even more volatile. So, what should investors' strategy be in the current market? Harshita Singh and Rex Kano's report has the answer. With a bit over two months into 2023, equity markets have waded into troubled waters. While investors were hoping to move past Adani-related worries, renewed fears of higher interest rates, the collapse of three regional banks in the U.S., and fresh trouble at Swiss lender Credit Suisse have accelerated the pain for equities. As evident from technical charts, the Nifty benchmark index has been trading in a strong downtrend over the last three months. Last Friday, the index gave up its 200 DMA of 17,450 and has consistently ended below this level since then, indicating pessimism among market participants. Analysts believe the Overall trend for the index remains negative, and as long as it stays below the 200 DMA, selling pressure will likely continue. Nifty has breached the 200 DMA. The 200 daily moving average is placed at 17,462. As long as we stay below these levels, expect the selling pressure to continue. Now, since we have corrected a lot, Nifty is trying to find a support, and that support is at 16,900. If we manage to hold that support, we can expect a mild pullback or recovery rally towards 17,300, 17,462 zone. But if 16,900 is not held, we can expect the correction to again go towards the levels of 16,700. So overall, the broader trend remains negative, and one should keep a sell-on rise approach. Meanwhile in the derivative segment the open interest in Nifty March futures rose by 21.3% in the last four sessions while the index was down 3.5% during this time hinting at a build up of short positions open interest refers to the total number of outstanding derivative contracts a fall in the price of an underlying asset with a rise in its open interest indicates bearishness that said even though the near term market outlook remains downbeat the economy's strong fundamentals make analysts confident of a firm recovery from a one year pause perspective hence they suggest investors bottom fish fundamentally good stocks amid current weakness 
as far as the news flow on uh, this Silicon Valley Bank uh, SVB is concerned, I think it is more of a knee-jerk reaction to some other banks. So, you know, we have to outgrow this habit which is inculcated in us that anything and everything that happens in US or anywhere in the world has got its direct consequences in India. I think we have to get a little bit matured. I think if you're not looking at next three to six months, if you're looking at next year, year and a half, these are great times to create a portfolio. You can invest in stocks that you wanted to invest at values that you wanted to invest. Don't rush into the market. Be a disciplined investor and invest over a period of time. In between that, in the next three to four months, we'll be facing monsoon season. There also there is a news flow that because of only note, the monsoons might be below normal. But in case if the weather changes and if the impact is less, then even if we get normal or little bit lower than normal, then inflationary concerns will not be something that we'll be worried about, especially with food or agri, you know, uh, inflation in case of shortfall of monsoon. So all this is creating and along with that uncertainty in, in terms of news flow from the overseas market. You should expect a you know, low, higher single digit or a lower double digit kind of return as far as this calendar year is concerned up to December 2023. Overall, analysts suggest investors do not make allocations in one go and keep a medium term view on the market as the El Nino impact and the interest rate trajectory play out. Today, equity markets will trace the global mood for queues. Investors will also react to the European Central Bank's monetary policy decision. recent report by the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, has once again triggered a face-off between the ruling dispensation and the opposition. This has brought back focus on the murky nexus between politics and art. While Union Minister Anurag Thakur's recent dig at the Congress about an alleged case of illicit proceeds is doing the rounds on social media, let's find out what is FATF. On March 13th, Union Minister Anurag Thakur slammed Congress for a FATF report. A case study in the FATF report has an uncanny resemblance to a money laundering investigation that reportedly involves a former banker and a politician. Headquartered in Paris, the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, is an intergovernmental watchdog tasked with combating global financial crimes. When we talk about global economic offences, it includes two significant crimes. These are money laundering and terror financing. India is a part of the FATF along with 39 other member countries. Together, all these countries develop policies and set international standards. They aim to collectively generate necessary political resolutions to drive change in regions affected by financial offences. Here's some history. In 1989, the Group of Seven, or G7 countries, established the FATF to counter the growing money laundering problem. While combating the core issue, the organization examined money laundering techniques and trends. It also reviewed measures executed at the national and international levels. The FATF expanded its role to counter terror financing after the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks. You might have also read reports of Pakistan swinging in and out of the FATF's grey list as the country failed to fulfil the organization's action plan on multiple occasions. But do you know there are two major lists that the FATF categorises suspect countries into? One is the grey list. FATF's grey list puts those countries into the spotlight that are considered a haven for supporting terror funding and failing to prevent global money laundering. Such countries must comply with the organization's recommendations and are subject to intense monitoring. Until last year, Pakistan was a part of this grey list. However, countries that continue to defy regulations on global financial offences are put on the blacklist. These countries are known as non-cooperative countries or territories. Blacklisted countries face economic sanctions such as an international boycott and reduced trade with other countries among other wide-ranging consequences. As of 2023, North Korea, 
Iran and Myanmar are countries blacklisted by the FATF. The FATF is integral to global financial systems as it cracks down on multiple financial offenses. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. According to the FATF report, trade in art, antiquities and other cultural objects is a billion dollar industry globally. The market has attracted criminals, organized crime groups and terrorists who seek to launder proceeds of crime and fund their activities, the report says. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.